Okay, well, Steve, uh, thank you for your, uh, your human being talk. Um, yeah, I, I uh, like to be in gallery view when we're doing this. Um, so I was able to see a lot of faces when uh, you were talking and all through the talk, I saw people kind of smiling and nodding and, uh, you know, uh, relating to this in a, a very uh, personal way, I think. And, uh, you know, <sighs> this is really is sort of the story of living in his life in his human form. It's like the one thing we're not supposed to do. There's one thing you don't, you don't do this one thing. And immediately, almost immediately, this is a great theme in literature. That's the one thing we do. And then we live with the repercussions. Uh, that's a pretty old story. Um, also, I was thinking about uh, uh, almost what a personal insult it is when these fragile bodies that we move around in are affronted that way by some sort of injury or some sort of outrage and how personal and shocking that sort of thing is to us when it happens. Um, and just how we all deal with that in our own individual ways. Um, what I think is interesting about that is that maybe that's the first inkling we get, how fragile we are um, and possibly the first inkling of how someday it's all going away. <laughs> no matter what I feel, no matter what shape I'm in physically, no matter what I think about it, no matter what I say about it, any capability that I may have is just simply going to disappear. And that is uh, a rude awakening for, uh, for us, I think, as, as people. But one we all share, and that's what's so, uh, what I really appreciate about uh, these sorts of talks and just watching everybody respond to that like, you got it. You got it, Steve. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there with you, man. <laughs> and because uh, we've all we all live that. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that talk. Um, so are there any questions? <clears throat> Someone suggested, I can't think of what it was, but saying that in another way, not are there any questions, but uh, I, can't, I can't think of the phrase. Someone, uh, someone suggested a phrase that may elicit. Uh, Dennis, this isn't really a question, but about a month ago, you mentioned Ram Das, yes. and you said you were looking for a book and the only book I have is one entitled The Only Dance There Is, and it was a group of his lectures. Is that what you were looking for? Um, well, that's very interesting, actually, that you mentioned that, because um, just two days ago, a friend of mine sent me uh, a book called Being Ram Dass. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure everybody knows who Ram Dass is. He was a psychologist at Harvard back in the uh, early 60s. Who was a confederate of Timothy Leary, who was, uh, and they were both famously uh, fired by Harvard for doing LSD experiments on graduate students. And then, of course, Tim Leary went on to, you know, uh, be one of the, I don't know, progenitors of the psychedelic movement back in the 60s. And uh, 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 Richard Alpert, was, uh, Ram Dass's name, went off to India to try and figure out a way to um, make these psychedelic experiences permanent. And he had some very interesting experiences and uh, became a, um, a teacher uh, and he came back to the West, came back to the United States with the name Ram Das and uh, began teaching. Uh, and his first famous book was called Be Here Now. Um, then the only thing there is, is the book Vera was referring to. Um, the book I was thinking about was called How Can I Help? And I actually found it on Amazon because I started looking for it um, you know, after I thought about it, which is uh, quite a wonderful book. Um, for anybody, it's specific, well, it's, it's more or less specifically directed to, to people in the helping professions. Um, but, you know, basically, that's everybody. <laughs> One way or another, some of us don't realize it, but yeah, that's, that's basically all of us. So it's, it's, it's quite a wonderful read. Um, so I just started this book a friend sent me, and in the introduction, um, a friend of a friend of his who helped him edit it saying i love this he's he's passed on he's dead now he died i think about about a year and a half ago maybe um and this friend was saying you know what i loved about him was he was still with this the 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 same sort of uh neurotic uh, unsure person that i've always known all through his life you know and it wasn't like he was out there saying this solves all my problems but he was living this very human existence which i 
appreciate it a lot because I'm, uh, it's very easy to think that uh, we're doing this practice or undertaking this practice to somehow uh, improve ourselves, to be the best version that we can be of ourselves, to get beyond, you know, this suffering, this pain, this, in, this confusion, this uh, uh, unsatisfactoriness that we seem to find in life. And the older I've gotten, the more apparent it seems that it's, it's more a question of coming to terms with it. You know, that this is not something that we escape from. And actually, there's, there's, uh, there's some uh, Conan out there that actually address this quite specifically. It's, it's, uh, they're very interesting. Um, this is our life. You know, you know, as Steve said, we're, we're, we're mortal, we're fallible, we are confused, we're fearful. Um, we're checking ourselves constantly about what's going on. We're always worried about what we're putting out to people and what they're thinking about us. And then, you know, even beyond that, what we're thinking about ourselves. How am I dealing with this? Am I supposed to do that? Am I, you know, am I, am I wrong to think this? Uh, you know, it's, it's just endless. Um, so part of the point of practice is just all of us is just being with that. Because ordinarily we don't, we're not aware of it. And that that's quite remarkable. We think our real world is the sort of sum of all that stuff that's going on. Uh, you know, as we're sort of in quiet desperation, trying to live our lives and get through life with, the, you know, uh, as little uh, dissatisfaction as we can. Um, which just doesn't work, but we, we keep doing it over and over and over and over again, thinking that somehow it will. You know, that somehow this is all, all of this strategizing, all of this thought, all of this uh, wishing and hoping and checking and all of that going on is somehow going to lead to something <laughs> eventually. But the sad fact is it just doesn't. And the word for that is samsara. <laughs> so there's a story, I think it was about Kyung Ho Sinim, who had uh, who had gone to a monastery where a, a class of monks was like essentially graduating, you know, from their study. And um, so it was a big ceremony and he was in the back and uh, the person presiding recognized him and asked him to say a few words, you know, to these uh, to these uh, young monks that were going out into the world on their own. And uh, he 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 got up and said something to the effect of my one wish for you is that you free yourself from conceptual thinking. And that was it. So it's easy to misunderstand that, you know, uh, and uh, a lot of people ask this question as they undertake practice. Um, so how can I not think? Does my thinking have to stop? You know, do I, do I have to give up thinking? How am I going to tell time? How am I going to get up and get dressed to go? I mean, I've heard these literal questions over the years. You know, how am I going to know what clothes to put on in the morning if I don't think? Um, so I think that's misunderstanding what Kyung Ho Sinim said. Uh, you know, we're, that's not going to stop. You know, thinking is what your mind does. It's what your mind perceives, just like your eyes perceive light and your ears perceive sound waves and your body perceives sensations and your tongue perceives taste. Your mind perceives thoughts. Um, and that's, that's its job. But he said, free yourself from that. He didn't say stop doing it. Which means, you know, Desan Sanim, Zen Master Sung San called that your backseat driver. So it's like you're going through life, say your body's a car, you're going through life, and the driver's saying, oh, go that way, go that way. And you're, okay, I'll turn. You're, no, 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 go that way, go that way. And this is like basically a version of following our likes and dislikes. And we're always listening to that. You know, I like this, I'll go over there, get more of that, I want more of that. Oh, I don't like this, I wanna get away from that. My foot hurts. I'm, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to think right about it so that it, you know, it'll get better and my life will be better. Or I'm going to, you know, whatever it is, we got some idea about that. That's our backseat driver. But that won't stop. But you don't have to be controlled by it. Uh, but to not be controlled by it, you have to see it. You have to see it clearly, and that's really fundamentally what practice is about. It's just looking inside yourself just looking inside yourself that can get sometimes sometimes that's ecstatic you know Ram Das wrote a lot about that you know about how he's had these experiences in India that were just ecstatic visions and sometimes it's just absolute despair sometimes it's just I'll never get this it's never going to stop it's just so painful 
so on and so forth. You know, these are all things we all experience. But the trick is, the big secret is, the big open secret is, don't attach to these things. There's nothing in this world that you can attach to that's going to lead you to any sort of satisfaction. Just let it be. Just see it clearly. That seems to be what's required of us in this practice. And so what I've always appreciated about practice as it's come down to us through, from Zen Master Sung San is it's always very clear about that. You know, it's always pointing right at that one thing relentlessly. And he used to, you know, he said one time, uh, a student asked him, someone asked him, uh, Sun Sanim, you, you always, uh, you, you come here every year and you give us a talk and you always say the same thing. And he said, yeah, but nobody hears it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I love Ram Dass. You know, I'm looking forward to reading this book. And I think, uh, you know, he, for all his human foibles, which we all have, which, uh, you know, he really did a lot of good in the world, uh, serious good in the world. And uh, I, I met him once years ago, a long time ago. And uh, uh, it's quite an interesting encounter. So um, I'd re I would really recommend that book highly, How Can I Help? Uh, it's, it's, it's quite useful, quite, uh, quite a good read. Amazon. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, I get it. Oh, I'm sorry. Please continue. About brief comments about Ram Dass, if I may. Sure. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 50s, where we most people didn't have cars, and we, we you know, walked to school and walked to church and whatever. And if you were lucky, a nice boy would walk you home. Mm -hmm. And and one my one of my favorite quotes from Ram Dass is, "We're all just walking each other home." <laughs> yeah, thank you. that's my offering. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Actually, that was in the forward to this book. That's a great line. Um, what was the other thing? He, he said, uh, "Oh, there's two things you have to remember: um, love everybody and your social security number." <laughs> which I thought was a pretty good summation of life in this world these days. I'll throw in another quote that I just heard the other day. This is my new favorite quote, not from him. Um, uh, what is it? If faith can move mountains, what's it take to leave them alone? <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good one for these days. Did, did someone else have a question? Someone else started to say something. Uh, yes, Dennis, I have a question. Actually about um, books and um, Zen Master Sung Song and his writing career. Um, I'm currently on the, on the West Coast in California in Tomales at this beautiful little organic farm. Uh, but last weekend I was in Virginia and I was in a little bookstore and in the poetry section, I stumbled upon a book called A Bone in the Void in this tiny little bookstore in, um, in Virginia. And it said it was written by Sung Song and it was a book of poetry. And I was wondering, is that the founder of this school, which I assume it is, and how many books did, did he write? And did he write a lot of poetry? I, uh, I did pick it up and, and buy it, but I didn't, uh, I haven't looked at it. What was, what was the title? A, a Bone in the Void, I believe. Bone of Space. Bone, I thought it was Void, but I, I, I will have to look. What's the name? Judy, Stan, Dick Long's name? You're muted. Bone of space. Bone of space. Yeah, yeah, bone oh, of space. space. Okay. Yes, that is one of his books. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many books he wrote. There, um, there's a lot of books. Um, um, well, yeah. <laughs> what would I? Maybe a dozen books out there of his teaching. I would say. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we do classes uh, on some of the on some of his writings. Uh, there's Ten Gates, uh, which is a book about his, his style of Kongan practicing. Um, there's a 365 uh, uh, Kongans in the whole world as a single flower, which we use for Kongan practicing. Um, what else? <laughs> now I'm stuck for titles. <laughs> but yeah, there's a whole variety of books out there. Um, Compass of Zen. That's the Compass of Zen. Yeah, that's what I was trying to think of. Sorry. I'm... But uh, 
books can be useful or they can be a hindrance. You know, that's, that's the sort of interesting thing. Um, I'd have to say one reason I'm practicing at all is because I started reading about uh, this kind of practice years ago and sort of fell in love with what I thought of at the time as the romance of it, you know, living in rags up on a mountain, reciting poems to the moon, that kind of thing. <laughs> it sounded great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you can you can live in that. You can stay there forever. You know, you can sort of kind of read about it. I always I read about it a lot and really felt reassured somehow. I thought, oh, it's great that this is out there somehow. You know, there's just that there's this possibility. There's this. Uh, there's this tradition, there's this lineage, there's this practice, something like that. And it was very reassuring, but that never got me off the dime to actually start practicing. You know, it wasn't books. I mean, that was, that was, it was sort of an inspiration, but it took something else to actually uh, get me onto a cushion. And once you're on a cushion, um, it's easy to sort of displace whatever you're trying to work on into, into reading about it. Uh, and that's kind of dangerous. That can be kind of dangerous or counterproductive because um, it sort of reinforces the idea that the solution, the, the goal, the whatever, however you choose to characterize it, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're seeking there, as you sit is somehow out there. You know, it's to be found out there. And no matter how good the book is, and no matter how good the advice is, or no matter what a great Dharma talk you hear, no matter what sort of teaching you get in the Conan, or any of that, it's always, it's always here. It's always inside. That's what your focus needs to be. So books can be very useful. And um, I like Zen Master Sung San's books because they're very direct, you know, about this practice. Um, and they're, they're like, yeah, pretty much they're like manuals for how to do this. Um, not a lot of speculation, you know, a lot of good stories, um, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a little, little bit of a uh, narrow path, you know, in terms of reading. Um, so if you go to a long retreat, like if you go to Kielce, uh, you know, uh, books are not permitted, except for Zen Master Sung San's books are allowed if you want to read those, you know. Um, because of, you know, you don't want to spend all your time speculating. Uh, speculation is not productive <laughs> in terms of this practice. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not. I think a sense of wonder is kind of an, uh, a, re a natural result of this practice, but I don't believe that necessarily has to lead to speculating about things and trying to work out you know, how things work, how or why, or any of that. And I'm not so sure it's so useful. And at a certain point, I think maybe books uh, serve that function, trying to scratch that itch, that sort of speculation itch. So yeah, he wrote a lot of books. I'd highly recommend them. Um, that's not just out of partisanship. It's just, I've read a lot of books and I've not found um, too many others to the level of, uh, you know, what he's presented to us or what's, what's preserved in those of his teaching. So yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, if you want to maintain this practice that you uh, get some familiarity with them. Part of it's just learning, um, I don't know what you call it, like the folklore of this practice. Years ago, one book that I read that set me off uh, fairly seriously was a book by Gary Snyder, American poet, um, called The Real Work. And in one of those, uh, it's a book of essays, and in one of those essays, he writes about uh, why he stays with Zen practice. And it was very interesting, but he said, uh, you know, he said, well, we got these three mysteries in our lives that we're all born into, you know, we have this body, this mind, and this speech, you know, these are all very mysterious things, but this practice really addresses all of these things. Each one of these mysteries, these sort of mysterious things that we we use every day, you know, without much thought. But if you really stop and just sort of take stock, you know, like Steve, he was sitting there immobilized and didn't have a lot of choice, you know, about how he was going to do things every day. It, you, you just sort of stop and take stock of things. You realize how mysterious it is that any of this exists. But what I was leading to in this is that he talks about, Kong, well, he call it Kong practice, Kongan practice uh, as the folklore of Zen. 
And I kind of like that idea and I'd sort of like to encourage people to think about it that way. Um, because it's, it's sort of like learning a language. It's sort of like learning a history. It's sort of like learning the, uh, the form of the way that this teaching is transmitted to us and that we transmit it in turn. Um, I worry sometimes that everybody think of it, thinks of it as, as more or less like, like an exam. <laughs> and I either pass or I fail. And it's not like that at all. It really isn't. Uh, pass, fail, good answer, bad answer, doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, but what you find is if you do this, if you do this open-heartedly, if you can do this sincerely and trustingly, it really takes a lot of trust for all of us to do this uh, sort of practice with another person that, you know, sometimes something really hits you, bam, connects with you, connects with your life. And that's the point. You know, you see that yourself. And then I think I was saying this to you before, then that becomes yours, you know? So what seems like this kind of arcane story from medieval China suddenly becomes relevant and flowers and, you know, becomes, you. yeah, my life's just like that. Uh, and that's quite a remarkable moment. And I don't know anything else in my life that's really led to that in that sense, you know? So uh, I'm very appreciative for it. Um, so like, don't like, doesn't matter. You know, just uh, the important thing is to just do it. And that's what Sangha is all about. That's why we support each other, even if it is <laughs> through electrons flying through space. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 uh, it's invaluable. And it's a, a wonderful support because all of us, as Steve points out so eloquently, are in that same situation, you know. Um, so I'll finish just by thanking everyone uh, that's, that's practicing, uh, that's come to this practice uh, greatly, just greatly just has so much appreciation. Uh, that is the other thing that always astounds me about this is that when we all practice together, there's just a sort of natural flowering of gratitude, which is, it, that is a real mystery to me too, how you can just sit silently together in a room and bang, you know, it's always there at the end. And it's, oh, thank you, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> um, before we finish, I have something I'd like to say. Um, I'm feeling a profound sense of sorrow for a lot of reasons, but especially for the people who were murdered in the Atlanta spas. Um, and I want to apologize because I didn't think to gather the names of them and put them into the chat for us to uh, chant Zhijiang Bosa. Um, I thank you, Dennis, for bringing up the Conan work because I think what will help me with my profound sense of sorrow is to study Sat Chujo Sweeps, which is the story of the, I think she was from China, the she was a student of a, of a teacher and she became a teacher herself. And when her granddaughter died, she wept and people questioned her about her, her, um, her enlightenment and, and why she was weeping. And she said that her, her tears did more for her granddaughter than all of the sutras. So I just wanted to say that and I'm thinking of all of my Asian sisters and brothers and siblings in the Dharma. You. Margaret, Margaret, thank you. I just want to point out the obvious, which is we are all studying Asian cultures, mm -hmm. Chinese, Korean, Japanese. We have immersed our lives in the wisdom of these Asian cultures. And, and so it's especially resonant for us, this mm -hmm. tragedy that happened. Thank you, Margaret, for mentioning it. Well, thank you both. Um, mm. So uh, announcements?